Okay, let's pray, shall we? Father God, uh, I thank you that you have clearly given us a theme this morning. I thank you for these words that we've already heard and the words that you've given me now. I ask you, Lord, that you would open all our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what you have to say, what you have already said this morning, and what you are continuing to say. Bless us, please, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, there is clearly a theme this morning. It's God's theme. It's not our theme. Um, so just continue in it. God is love. Let's start with 1 John 4, 16 and 17. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. The word used here for love is agape, which is the highest of the four types of love that I understand are referred to in the Bible. The word defines God's immeasurable incomparable love for humankind. It is the divine love that comes from God. Agape love is perfect, unconditional, sacrificial and pure. Unfortunately, of course, in, England, in English we don't have this distinction. We are stuck with the single word love, which is a bit like using the word nice to describe something we like. That's a Forrester word, by the way, nice. <laughs> Jesus Christ demonstrated this kind of divine love to his Father and to all humanity in the way he lived and died. Again, John 3.16, we've had it already. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God is love. Our faith lives are a journey of revelation, of awakening to spiritual, spiritual truths, journeys of discovery and of decisions, and the constant realignment of our thoughts and the paths we walk to bring them in line with those of God's. One of the biggest truths we need to discover for ourselves is God is love. That is a profound spiritual truth. I suppose I should feel awkward in admitting this, but in the early years of my faith, I was often irritated when I heard Christians saying, God is love. It seemed like such a glib, hippish statement. I would look at the world around me, seeing all the unpleasantness, all the evil, knowing that God was going to intervene drastically one day and put it all right, the wrath of God. It seemed to me that it was far too simplistic to say, God is love. There was far more to God than just love. My thinking was very limited. Maybe my irritation was because I knew it meant that I needed to show and feel love where I didn't, or more importantly, where I didn't want to. Like you, I am on a journey. We're all on a journey. Our journey started when we were born. But the truth is, it didn't start very well. We should have been born in Eden, the earthly dwelling place of our Creator, in whose image we are made, a place of security and a physical and spiritual well-being, a place of life. But we were not. 
Instead, we were born outside of the garden. Not only outside of it, but our way back into it was barred. We are told that the entrance is guarded by divine beings with a flaming sword, preventing access into the garden, and specifically to the tree of life. We were born in a fallen world, a world in rebellion to God. That is a truth that we must understand and not lose sight of. It's a knowledge that moulds our world view and gives us clarity of vision. But alongside that, we must not lose sight of an incredible truth. And that is that we are all, each one of us, made in God's image. Whether we personally know God or not, we are made in his image. And that means that excluded from the garden or not, we are still the focus of God's attention and his love. But what on earth, and I mean literally what on earth, does that mean? Made in the image of God, bearing God's image. There's apparently an issue with understanding of the original language used or the finding of suitable English words to convey what the original language is actually conveying, similar perhaps to the problem we have with the word love. To say we are made in God's image is not simply saying that we look like him or have similar attributes. It is also saying that we are made as God's image here on earth. That is to say, we are created to image God. The image is, the image is not so much a look or an ability, but a status. We are God's image. We are designed to be embodied reflections of God. And as such, we have standing with God that is above all the rest of creation, even above the angels, if we look at 1 Corinthians 6.3. So how we are with others, how we relate to them, how we treat them, and how we behave generally should reflect God to all and everything in creation. We were created to be his image here on earth, and we were created to be fruitful, in his image. I think we have lost sight of this. The corrupt world that we have grown up in has very successfully blinded us to our intended and true status. We don't consider ourselves in this way. We don't respect ourselves in this way. And we certainly don't respect others in this way. Our exclusion from Eden was itself an act of love. For God to follow through his intention to create us in his image, he had to give us the attribute of free will. The fact that we use that free will to rebel against him was a foreseeable consequence of the gift. And although no doubt our rebellion caused God great pain, it was not enough for him to turn his back on us. He loved us. We were created in his image. He may have temporarily excluded us from access to the garden, from the tree of life, which was for our own eternal good. We may now be outside of the garden, but we are still his image with the incredible potential that that promises. His plan for us hadn't changed. It couldn't change or God wouldn't be God. It's just got delayed. God's love for his image bearers has not diminished. As children of God living in a corrupted world, how much more so is it important that we recognize that we are to be living as God's image amongst all those who were created in his image but don't yet know it? And show them the same love that God does, helping them to find their way back to God. The words I'm speaking challenge me personally. 
and they it's too easy for me to speak these words they come out of my mouth a bit too easily I generally do not like the world but what is the world if it's not people as I look back and consider my personal journey I realise that the most significant change that God brought about in me and I have to admit I fought it every step of the way was the way I viewed other people people made in the image of God I had a bad time at secondary school I didn't fit in very, very well and that made me a target the result of which was that as a matter of self-preservation I developed a very defensive attitude towards people I built a wall the wall may have been defensive but it was mentally aggressive and it categorized people unfairly and passed judgment on them come the revolution you know I hadn't really given God any consideration I had been brought up in a church going family but I didn't know God I know now and can actually see very clearly that God knew me and I can see quite definitely some of the times when he broke through into my life to set things in motion ready for a future time when I was going to be in a position to be able to respond to him when I did come to know God I was still very heavily dependent on the wall that I had built. I couldn't see the wall, of course, and didn't acknowledge it existed as such, but it was there. God knew the wall was there, and he didn't like what it was built with. He made it very clear to me that it needed dealing with. He showed me something I found very hard to deal with, to come to terms with. He showed me that he, he actually loved the people that I hated as much as he loved me. I found that very hard because it meant I had to change. I had to start to dismantle the wall. Dismantling the wall was hard and it took a long time. It was there for a purpose and I was subconsciously dependent upon it. 1 John 4.16, where we started. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Having expelled us from Eden, God had no intention of leaving us in the wilderness on our own as one of Satan's trophies. He set about a plan of restoration, a plan to undo what Satan had achieved. It involved working through a chosen group of people, a nation of people that he set aside as his own, and working through that people to a specific point in time when the time was right for an incredible act of love and humility, but also a strength. God became physically a man, Jesus. He came into the world that he had created with the intention of giving everything for us, a world that still did not want him. To those who would turn back to him, he, he would turn away from the darkness, back towards his light, he would gift the status he had originally intended for us, he would give us back the right to be his children, the ultimate act of love, Agape love, perfect, unconditional, sacrificial and pure. We may sometimes think that God's plan was complicated and long drawn out, but we have to understand that there's far more going on than we can see. The rebellion that had taken place was not limited to ourselves. There was also a rebellion taking place in heaven a rebellion of heavenly beings who were perhaps jealous of God, what God had created in us and the position we held in his affection. We are the apple of his eye. And I suspect they understood that, understood the love that God has for us far more than we do. 
When God became a man, Satan had no understanding of his plan. Satan must have been rubbing his hands in glee. Victory was within his grasp. How could God have made such a blunder, making himself so vulnerable? If Satan had known anything of God's plan, he wouldn't have sought God's death, anything but Jesus' death. John 3.16 again. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That cosmic moment that Jesus rose from the dead, Satan must have been totally appalled, absolutely gobsmacked as he realised what Jesus had done by taking upon himself our sin and what he had achieved by dying our death. Satan had completely failed to understand what had been going on for the previous 33 earth years. And now he could see his own end. Where does this soul leave us? Well, there is much for us to take on board and understand as we progress on our individual journeys. But maybe for all of us, the greatest thing that we all need to embrace is the truth that God is love and apply it firstly to ourselves, which is most important, and then to apply to everyone around us, especially perhaps to those we don't actually like. To begin to see people more as God sees them, to avoid judging them as maybe we do, to not reject or to discount people, but to try and understand how their journey has differed from ours and how their journey has made us different from ourselves or made them how they are. John 7, 24. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Pray for them and not against them. We are all victims of deception. We all fall short of the glory of God. Appreciate diversity within the parameters God has laid down. All are made in his image. So many just don't yet know it. Appreciate what a blessing it is to love. I could have said what a blessing it is to be loved, which of course it is. But if we are living our lives as the image of God, then maybe we should consider the greater blessing is in being able to love, to feel love for others as God does. If we live a life short on love for those around us, we are denying that they are also made in God's image. And we are setting ourselves against everything God has worked for and everything God is. I was, at church, I was at the Church of England christening service a few weeks ago and it included the words May God deliver you from the powers of darkness and restore you in the image of his glory. That should be our prayer for everybody around us. I, uh, I came across some words from C.S. Lewis the other day, which I would like to read to you. We were made for God. Only by being in some respect like him, only by being a manifestation of his beauty, loving kindness, wisdom or goodness, has any earthly beloved excited our love. It is not that we have loved them too much, but that we did not quite understand what we were loving. It is not that we shall be asked to turn from them, 
so dearly familiar to a stranger, when we see the face of God, we shall know that we have always been known. He has been a party to, has made, sustained and moved moment by moment within all our earthly experiences of innocent love. All that was true love in them was, even on earth, far more his than ours, and ours only because his. In heaven, there will be no anguish and no duty of turning away from our earthly beloved. First, because we shall have turned already from the portraits to the original, from the rivulets to the fountain, from the creatures he made lovable to love himself. But secondly, because we shall find them all in him. By loving him more than them, we shall love them more than we do now. One, 1 John four sixteen seventeen again. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. In Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city, back into the garden, and eat the fruit from the tree of life. I think the line, we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. It's a very challenging line. Thank you. Amen.